Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this parallel session on circular economy and resources. As you'll have gathered, I'm sure, from previous sessions, um, we've got two speakers in the session, and we're going to have speaker one first, followed by speaker two, and then time for questions at the end. So if you have questions as, as the talks are progressing, please do use the, the question and answer box um, and any comments as well. And then we'll pick those up at the end. And um, with a bit of luck, there'll be plenty of time to, for discussion at that point. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who is uh, Richard Thompson. He's Professor of Marine Biology and Director of the Marine Institute at the University of Plymouth. That's a sister institute to the Sustainable Earth Institute. And Richard's pioneered research into the causes and effects of marine litter. And so he's going to talk to us today about plastics, identifying challenges and finding solutions. So if I could invite Richard up onto the stage, uh, over to you, Richard. Well, thanks very much, Will. I'm just going to share my screen so that you can see me. Hopefully, could yeah, just confirm you can see the screen. Uh, great. Oh, I can see it now as well. So, yeah, let's come up, thank you very much. Thanks, for, thanks, Will. Thanks for the introduction. So I'm Richard Thompson. I'm Professor of Marine Biology. I've spent more than the last 20 years, I guess, studying litter in the marine environment. It's not what I thought marine biology was going to be about. When I, when I went off to be an undergraduate, I thought it was going to be about coral reefs and turtles and sharks and dolphins. But somehow I seem to have spent, my, spent the last 20 odd years researching marine litter. And it's that topic that I want to talk to you about now. And I'm saying marine litter and actually the talk's about plastic. And that's really comes from my first slide, which is to make it clear that there's lots of different types of litter in the marine environment, metal, glass, wood, rubber. But the vast majority is plastic, 75 percent from this survey of European shorelines. And it's the same pattern, more or less worldwide. Even if we go down to the depths of the ocean, we still find that plastic, plastic litter is the dominant form. And so. I think the current focus on plastics and plastic waste is very justified. It's difficult now to walk on a shoreline anywhere in the world and not find plastic litter, literally within a few metres of walking. Here we see a plastic bottle on a shoreline in Slovenia. But if we take a deep sea submersible down to a place never before visited by humans, here we see the deep sea in the Mediterranean. It's those same items of litter mainly plastic, that are dominating. They've beaten us to an unexplored place, our items of waste. I think it's worth emphasizing at this point, and, and there's an economy sometimes in my words, and particularly I see it in media articles, as though plastic and plastic litter is one thing. And I've emphasized already there are different types, different materials that are part of litter, but even within plastic, there's a wide range of different types of plastic, spanning orders of magnitude of different sizes from large items that are so big you can literally see them from space. Indeed, the picture on the far left is the tail cone of a European Space Agency rocket. It's not all plastic, but it's got plastic composites in it that made it lightweight, helped it get into space. I don't find many of those items. I've only found one in 25 years or so of study. But then we go down to the, through the items you've seen, the bottles and the bags, to the microplastics. Pieces still just about visible to the naked eye in the middle of the picture here. Pieces taken from the River Tamar, close to where I work in Plymouth. And then, well, where does it stop? What are the tiniest pieces of plastic? Most scientists in the field believe there will be nanoparticles of plastic in the environment that are formed by the breakdown of these larger things. But they're actually, at the moment, below the level of detection to recover them from an environmental sample and confirm that we've got plastic at that nano scale. But we suspect that it's there. Apart from the size, there are thousands of different permutations of polymers and polymer additives. So my point is, this is a very complex mixture. It's a very heterogeneous type of contaminant that arises from many different sources. And that means it's kind of what I would describe as a wicked problem. There's no single solution. So if I painted a picture of the distribution of debris, and we could literally have spent 20 minutes talking about the evidence of where it is. The the quantities in the ocean are likely to triple. So it's very clear then that we've got a problem. I guess the next question that leads me to is, well, so what? Is it harmful? How harmful is it? 
and that's where I want to go next. And again, I could spend literally a whole talk um, dealing with the issues of harm. It's clear from what we know already that there's widespread economic harm, there's harm to human health and well-being, and there's harm to wildlife. Indeed, work from psychologists here at the University of Plymouth has shown that even relatively small quantities of plastic, um, the picture in the bottom in the middle there, can cause negative effects on human well-being, that they significantly depress the what the psychologists would call the restorative value of our engagement with the natural environment. And those effects are likely to be occurring on a very, very broad scale across more or less the whole of the planet. The effects on wildlife are incredibly well documented. Uh, over 700 species known to encounter this litter. Many of those encounters are known to be negative and some of them result in fatalities. The point I want to move to now, though, quite quickly, because, again, we could spend the whole talk discussing harm. And I want to ask you the question, really, is there enough evidence of harm to take action or are the current knowledge gaps that we have around marine litter and plastics so substantial that they paralyze as they hold us back from taking action and it's not a scientific question it's a philosophical one i've only spent a few minutes talking about the harm and we could go on for it at length but it's a question i think i need to ask each of you to consider is there enough scientific evidence of a problem and if there is then what do we do about it it's certainly clear to me as a scientist working in the field that there are evidence gaps. We, we need to know more about the relative importance of sources. We need to know more about the effects that might occur on, on human health and well-being. And we certainly need to know more about those nanoplastic particles that I said were below the level of detection. But my question really is, is there enough evidence already to take action? And if we've made that decision, then logically where that takes us is to the question, what are the solutions? And that's where I want to focus the next part of my talk. And in my view, those solutions are the text in yellow here. They're around designing, using and disposing of plastics far more responsibly than we've done so far. I want to make very clear here that in my view, plastics are not the villain. Plastics bring immense societal benefit. Plastics have the potential to reduce our human footprint on the environment. You think of lightweight parts in cars and aeroplanes that will reduce carbon emissions. You think of the multiple applications in hospitals and in schools. And even the plastic packaging that I illustrate there that's often picked on as the villain. It extends the life of food and drink in our shops and at home, effectively reducing food waste, which is another major environmental challenge. So how do we keep those benefits, which to me are very clear? without these largely unintended environmental problems that we've talked about, the economic, the wildlife, the effects on human health and well-being, How do we balance those two in a better way? I'm gonna digress just for a moment to some of the other challenges as a, as a marine biologist uh, I, I face in trying to understand. And I think there's something very different, fundamentally different actually about plastics than other challenges. If we want to take fish from the sea, of course we can try to do it sustainably, to supply us with, with food, with protein. But the afternoon after those fish in the picture were caught, ultimately there are directly and proportionately less fish in the ocean. The thing us humans want is directly and proportionately leading to a depletion. In the same way that the picture on the right, if we're all, well, at some stage able to take a, a holiday on a warm coastline like we see there, well, that requires the construction of hotels and apartments and the loss of the natural habitat that was once there, the loss of the home for the species that once lived there. But you can't have one without the other. But if I go back for a moment to those benefits of plastic, the lightweight, the versatility, the inexpensive nature, those pictures I illustrated of cars and the packaging, all of those things could be achieved without the current problems that we see at end of life. So the problem is different to some of the other environmental challenges. In short, it's not about not using plastics, it's about starting to use them far more responsibly than we have. If I cast our minds back here to the 1950s, the picture on the left hand side is from Time Life magazine. It's a center page article about the benefits to this family illustrated here that plastics will bring, the convenience that they will bring, the convenience given to them from a disposable society, a disposable throwaway culture. In the 1950s, we we're making 5 million tons of plastic globally. That waste from that disposable culture 
it's not a nice thing. It wasn't good then. But the point is, our use of plastics has grown exponentially over time, as has the human population. And so from 5 million tons in the 1950s, we're up to 360 million tons of plastic produced annually every year today. And 40 percent of all of that, the largest single use is in packaging, is in single use items where the benefit to society is really short lived compared to the car I highlighted earlier. But the persistence as waste or as litter is incredibly long lasting, hundreds, if not thousands of years. And that's the issue we need to address where the benefits are short lived, but the waste that results as a consequence is long lasting. So what do we do? And, and this is, you know, it's slightly frustrating because I feel that there aren't any new kids on the block here. We've known about the solutions for a long time and they are about things like reduce, reuse and recycle. They're absolutely still center stage. Reduce. Well, sure, there are things where we didn't perhaps need the plastic in the first place and, and we should stop using them. And reuse is also, I would argue, a part of reduction. The reusable carrier bag that we see there with the elephant on it is driving down the, the, the use of single use disposable plastic carrier bags. Did we all need drinking straws? Should we ban them? Perhaps we should. Is it a plastic free aisle in the supermarket? To me, that's going a step too far because I think we'll see increasing food wastage as a consequence of that. And in many cases, plastics is the best material to package our food and drink in. It's not about the use in packaging. It's about making sure we've designed appropriately. And I'll come to some examples of that in a moment. A fundamental part where I think there's immense scope for improvement is recycling. And that's not to say recycling is a silver bullet. It certainly won't solve the problem on its own, but there's definitely ground to be made here because most of the plastics we're producing, only about 10% are recycled. If we can crack this, and plastics are fundamentally recyclable materials if we design them appropriately, then we achieve a number of synergies because the carbon source for all the plastic is coming from non-renewable oil and gas, about 8% of world oil production. And the waste that we're generating there that's going to landfill and incineration is mostly plastic. In fact, we buried more plastic beneath the ground and burnt more plastic in incineration than has accumulated as litter in the oceans. It's that litter in the oceans that raises the public alarm. But actually, if we can fix the problem of litter, we probably simultaneously fix the problem of waste. If we can get that plastic or the carbon in the plastic to go around in a circular economy, then we decouple ourselves from the need for fossil oil and gas as the carbon source. And we also decouple ourselves from the generation of waste. So designing plastics for a more circular economy has to be a key part of the solutions. Not the only solution, but it needs to be a key part. And there's definitely scope for improvement. I want to look on this concept just briefly as I come towards the end of how it's really important that we now start to design products to deliver life in service. But at the same time, at that design stage, we think about end of life. And it's really frustrating to me when I talk to product designers. They say end of life. That was never in my brief. I was asked to design products to give life in service benefit and perhaps to look attractive, but end of life? Well, no, it's a disposable. That's where we need to take action. Here, I'm giving an example of the microplastics fibers from washing, not a disposable garment, a, sing, a, a garment that gives benefit over a lifetime, but every time we wash is potentially shedding thousands and thousands of fibers. And that's true of all of the garments that we might wash at home. These fibers are released to the environment. Well, where should we intervene? Okay, some would argue it's wastewater treatment, but most of the world's population don't have the benefit of wastewater treatment. And when we have collected fibers there by wastewater treatment, the typical practice is to return them to the land with the sludge, with the solids as a kind of fertilizer. So we've caught the fibers and then we're putting them back again. Some would say that we need devices on all of our washing machines at home to intercept the fibers. We could go down that route, but again, let's not forget that most of the world don't have the benefit of, of a fancy washing machine. And yet the research has already shown, I mean, research by my team and others, that there are very substantial differences in the rate of emissions from different types of garment. And that gives us a really strong clue that actually designing, designing those garments to shed fewer synthetic fibers is a really key part of the solution to fixing the problem at source. Similarly, if I think about the microbeads in cosmetics, did we really need to be cleansing ourselves in millions of tiny plastic particles? There, the solution has been a ban. 
And I think, well, that's a great achievement for environmental science leading to informed policy and leading to legislation. But then I, I noticed that the patent on the use of these bits of plastic in cosmetics was filed 50 years ago. And I asked myself the question, did nobody at the design stage or in the industry over those 50 intervening years ever ask the question, where are all these pieces of plastic going? In short, we need a greater extended producer responsibility stemming right from the design stage through to end of life and hopefully ultimately circularity. That I could say the same thing about these plastic bottles here. Yeah, I'm coming to the end, Will. These plastic bottles here on the left that are not ideally designed to take their part in the circular economy. We're in a place now where what we need to do is to translate the theory into action. I think there is enough evidence of a problem. I think public and policy are agreed that there's a problem as well as industry. We know what the solutions are. The bit that's missing is the trade-offs between those solutions. When do we recycle? When do we design for recycling? When do we design for reuse? Is clean up an option? We need independent scientific evidence in order to inform those decisions. And that is lacking in my view at the moment. We need to recognize that those solutions are gonna vary geographically according to the waste management infrastructure that's available. But, but finally, I would just say, that I think the current problem is actually a symptom. It's a symptom of this linear use of resource. And the answer is to focus on designing products better, designing them to be more compatible with a circular economy. And we need to harness the current interest in plastics in order to get us there. Thank you. Many thanks, Richard. Some questions are popping up um in the discussion piece so we'll, we'll pick up on those shortly um but first of all i'd like to introduce our second speaker to the stage um konstantin leonenko is the engagement manager of the digital fabrication and immersive media labs here at the university of plymouth and he specializes in blurring the boundaries between the physical and the digital and so i'd like to welcome him to the stage to talk to us about digital tools for sustainable practices so over to you leonenko konstantin uh -huh. Thank you, Will. Just a moment, there's uh, a time to keep track of uh, my time here. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you for welcoming me for the great that I think will uh, underlie all the conversations uh, that will come out of this because I think our thoughts overlap in uh, very interesting ways. Uh, so, what I would like to talk today. Uh, is uh, how digital fabrication and immersive media uh, is how they fit into the whole sustainability conversation. And uh, I'm not going to pretend that there's any kind of silver bullet uh, single answer to, and they are not uh, single answer to any of these uh, uh, problems we are we're dealing with and we are addressing. And uh, the way I would like to structure my talk is just to uh, give you an overview of some of the most interesting case studies that contributed to this conversation and hopefully that would steer our conversation further. So to start with, uh, I would like to define uh, what, what do we mean by digital fabrication and immersive media. So both of the technologies, uh, they start with code. When we turn code into things, we call digital fabrication. So the whole vocabulary of uh, abbreviations like CAD, CAM, CNC, 3D printing, manufacturing, all of these belong to the digital fabrication land. Whereas when we talk about immersive media, uh, we talk about uh, code term experiences and the whole vocabulary of, again, virtual reality, augmented, extended reality, full dome, all of these belong to uh, immersive media. Some of you may have recognized uh, the two references to Star Trek uh, sci-fi series. The top one is Replicator, uh, that is used often as inspiration for a lot of digital application technologies. And the whole deck on the bottom uh, that was uh, that is often referred to as the ultimate immersive experience. Uh, the interesting thing happens when we uh, the digital fabrication immersive media uh, when we turn the physical world back into digital using tools such as 3D scanning or motion capture. And what we have is pretty 
detailed simulation of the world, which we can then use to better design yet better digital fabricated objects and yet better digital experiences, immersive experiences. So, how these technologies are relevant? Uh, before we try to answer that, I would like you to look at this picture where Ken Thompson and Dennis Richie's, uh, Dennis Richie, some of the uh, early uh, computer scientists uh, back in the 70s, they're inventing Unix operating system and TCPAP protocol, which effectively means uh, uh, that and technology that were invented 50 years ago on machines that took up rooms and costed hundreds of thousands of dollars. This is exactly the technology we're using to communicate and talk about sustainability uh, across this uh, across this distributed conference. In the same manner, uh, the key applications, key enabling applications for the digital fabric media technologies are being developed right now that will shape our use and our understanding and our environment coming uh, at least 50 <laughs> years, imagine. Uh, so let's get just some case studies. Uh, Open Desk is a British company headquartered in. They have been distributed this manufacturing platform that connects uh, makers, designers, clients to one seamless experience. Effectively, a global digital supply chain for physical goods. So if you want a new uh, a new chair table in your uh, in your room or in your office uh, you go on their website you launch the augmented reality app you position it in your space you adjust it as you see fit the size and the height of your table uh, you order it so the gets uh, sent to the local to your closest manufacturer and the platform processes uh, uh, this transaction making sure that everybody benefits in the in process uh, another interesting perk is that uh, you can all of the designs are licensed under Creative Commons license, which means that you can use it for free for non-commercial use. So if you just want to share for yourself uh, and you have access to these kind of machines, you can uh, you can do it for free. Wikihouse, effectively another British uh, initiative uh, that uh, uses effectively the same materials, same plywood, same sheet of uh, uh, timber and uh, the same technology same CNC routers, but this time they're addressing global house problems. Uh, they're developing user-friendly, easy-to-assemble kits uh, that are actually architecturally compliant and passed all the regulations and certification. And again, you can download their houses for free and build them if you have access to this technology. Uh, both of these things actually uh, uh, can be uh, this term being uh, developed now that's being kind of established that's called digital timber uh, which allows to uh, to develop design model uh, and simulate timber structures that were even 10 years ago that were almost thinkable but right now we can simulate them we can make them energy efficient uh, and easy to manufacture uh, and transport and assemble uh, all thanks to them being uh, perfectly uh, digitally simulated and being able to work with them uh, with them in an uh, immersive uh, tool chain. So on the architectural uh, uh, landscape, another very interesting initiative is Italian company called WASP. Uh, they call themselves the WASPs that uh, build houses out of clay and uh, uh, this team has developed technology that local raw earth and clay with some minor additives, uh, but effectively 100% reusable material to 3D print houses on location. Each house takes about 200 in time, which is just about uh, un just under a month, uh, depending on your work schedule. And the uh, house is described in 7,000 lines of code. Just an interesting thing, which is uh, probably less than, than your email. Uh, uh, an interesting French initiative called Happy 3D. Uh, they have set uh, set up a kind of portal uh, that allows people to design, share uh, uh, spare parts for their for their consumer goods, like handles for toasters or vacuum cleaners, uh, and people can easily repair their objects by having access to this uh, to additive manufacturing and to 3D printing technology. And we can see that in this sense, additive manufacturing is a 
people of food right to movement that is uh, gaining momentum. Uh, some of the companies are taking additive manufacturing to the space. Uh, an American company called Relit TV Space uh, using by three printing their rocket. Uh, in some cases, they're able to cut down parts count from 3,000 to 30 parts and effectively produce rockets with zero wasted material rather than 80 or 90 percent wasted material that's uh, normally generated during standard subtractive manufacturing processes where you remove material from, from parts and then uh, put the parts back together. This way, complete rockets can be printed in just under two months. Uh, here is this interesting case study from Airbus and Renishaw. Uh, Renishaw is a British manufacturer of uh, 3D printing, metal 3D printing uh, systems, and they have calculated that they uh, place this manifold block, which, uh, which is effectively a huge chunk of aluminium, was drilled in it to uh, to reroute uh, various gas and liquid uh, pressurized uh, gases and liquids, which used to weigh 25 kilos. They shaved it down to 12 by 3D printing them. They would replace this one single, very primitive, simple part on the aircraft. They would save nearly metric tons of CO2 every year. Uh, BMW and NVIDIA, NVIDIA being the biggest uh, company, becoming the new, very quickly becoming the new Intel, uh, they have their development technology uh, for the digital twin factory where they can simulate complete factory down to every single nut and bolt, including digital humans, uh, which they use to tune uh, ergonomics of their workplace. And they can plan single part of this factory even before the first stone hits the ground, uh, which also allows uh, people across the globe to collaborate and to uh, to discover how uh, basic ergonomics of the user capture to track how people would be handling objects on the shop floor before that even, uh, before the shop floor even exists. So what we see ultimately is that digital fabrication immersive media, they completely reshape and restructure whole supply chains. Uh, and suddenly terms like virtual warehouse become uh, not a sci-fi, but a very practical term, very, uh, uh, very solid business decision that instead of putting your parts uh, in physical warehouses, you store them in on, uh, on online service and then get manufacture them on demand locally where they need to go to and the quantities that you need. Uh, so on this, what is uh, what is happening in our labs? Uh, how how would we do uh, even remote lines to what has been just kind of uh, discussed, shown? So for example, there is this little project that uh, uh, our technician uh, James Yard has helped to, uh, has helped our estate team to repair 55 uh, locks that uh, that have been broken on different places of campus, and uh, not just saving 3,000 pounds to our team, uh, to our estate team, they saved 45 of these high-tech locks from hitting the landfills. Uh, same technician James has recently helped uh, bring back to life 5,000 pound EMEA cameras and put them back into and for our students by just uh, uh, redesigning and uh, uh, reprinting uh, wind-up letters for these for the cameras that were uh, that are now very difficult to obtain. It nearly possible. None of this is being manufactured anymore, of course. So our students uh, use digital manufacturing and additive manufacturing, particularly to to try to understand what. Uh, repair means uh, in this context. Uh, what is it in the age of digital fabrication, how things can be designed and how uh, a general population perception of what what it means to repair objects and why we're repairing objects. Uh, he makes this beautiful, uh, beautiful artifacts uh, of very symbolic but very aesthetic repairs of uh, porcelain uh, objects and cultures. Uh, so another project that we've been uh, working with our uh, architect, uh, senior lecturer, Ravelis Riot, 
he has designed this uh, modular team uh, that we use to either, uh, well, basically architectural, architectural scale objects that can be fabricated in our, uh, in our lab. You can see a couple modules standing assembled. But at the same time, uh, before any of that uh, fabrication needs to happen, we can, in our immersive lab, we can try out, we can sketch, uh, prototype, and move these things, uh, uh, create different sculptures, structures, before we even cut a single piece of light. So uh, there you can see students handling these, uh, these modules to prototype uh, a structure before we assemble it. So with all of this, these technologies, uh, they're so widespread and their applications are so broad that uh, it is very difficult to clearly uh, to get a clear cut answer right now of what how they will shape our future. So the only way for and understand that is that we have to become literate in these technologies to understand how they shape our future. And uh, another initiative that we're developing is called a box where we create uh, where we have built this very low cost, hundred percent portable version of our lab. So you see up on the top there are three machines that cost hundreds of pounds. And down in the middle you can see machines that are tens of thousands and tens of thousands uh, and on below machines that are available on campus that are hundreds of thousands uh, but they effectively use the same uh, almost the same materials the same software and the same principles in operation that by learning to use them we can better understand how to apply them uh, so yet another flash to the history of computation so if we map how computing and how computing resources were becoming available this maps very clearly nearly one-to-one -one, uh, onto the digital fabrication and immersive media. So that's that's our lab in a box that we're going to be taking to law and finance and sociology, psychology and business people and showing the digital fabrication and immersive is not just for designers and game designers and architects, but effectively uh, if uh, compared to press, uh, not everybody needs to write a Bible and print the typesets, uh, a book like that, but some people just need to write a short message. But everybody needs to be lit in these technologies to understand how to uh, deal with them. So, thank you. Fantastic, thank you, Constantine. I was just about to press my button to tell you you have one minute left, so perfect timing. Um, so great, we've got 10 minutes for some discussion, which is, which is great, and there's some questions have come up in the Q&A. Um, maybe I'll start with something that's come up more in Richard's line, then we can move across to Constantine's and then see if we can find some common common ground between the two. Um, Richard, there's, there was some discussion about impacts and things. I think you wanted to maybe not go down the impact road at the moment, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the consumer side of the questions. Um, there's a question about how do we encourage consumers to, to really opt in to fully recyclable plastic? Um, but then there are other questions alongside other tensions with biodegradable as, as options as well. And also a point was made that that even high quality PET plastics will degrade during recycling. So there's only limited life okay. in terms of recycling. So there's sort of three angles there to sort of... No. Let me try and wrap them up then in one fairly succinct reply. But keep, keep me on track, Will, if I'm, ram if I'm rambling too much. So, I mean, to the, to the first... To the overall point of communicating with the consumer, yes, education is really going to be critical. But at the moment, the system we've got for circularity, I would argue, is is broken or at least slightly broken. And, and so it's very difficult to inform the, the, the consumer. You know, even the curbside waste collection that I have, have here, which is highly sophisticated, they're having immense problem with it. And consumers don't actually know what to do and what they can recycle and what they can't recycle. And part of the problem there is we've got too big a diversity of, of types of polymer and types of packaging for simple everyday applications. And that... We, we need to drive the demand up by simplifying the point to the PET. Yeah, you're right. There will be limits on how much circularity we can get. If I take an audience of recyclers into a supermarket, they will tell me that some of the best PET bottles as they see them, they could perhaps get to go around 20 times. The figure in the chat is saying seven to eight times. Whichever it is, you think about it, seven to eight times round in a circular economy, that's an 85% reduction in the amount of virgin polymer that we need. It's an 85% reduction in the amount of waste we generated. And that's based on the polymers we have 
at the moment. My point to design, and I like the comment that, of course, we teach circularity at the University of Plymouth. Yeah, we do. It needs to reach right into the polymer design stage. There may be ways that we can configure some of this packaging so that it can go around even more than seven or eight times or 20 times. You know, those numbers are based on current design principles. But even at that, if we get if we optimize it, we can get the plastic to go around and make a big reduction and yet i still see bottles made of pet that the recyclers will tell me they don't want because somebody at the design stage has put a coloring in there which halves the value in recycling so there's a lot we can do at the design stage um the tensions with biodegradables yeah i mean biodegradables have a part to play but let's not forget that one of the main things that makes plastic successful is actually their durability you know we don't want this bottle to be falling apart in the supermarket or in the back of the car or before we've had the picnic how do you get this bottle to know that it needs to be durable while it's holding the drink but the minute i've finished with it it's time for it to magically self-destruct so there's an incompatibility there in our expectations that this can disappear sufficiently rapidly as litter in the environment so the perspective on biodegradables is yes they have a place but from an eu scientific opinion that place is not in tackling the issue of marine litter. It's about uses where it's inevitable that the way you use the plastic means it'll end up in the environment, in, in fisheries or perhaps in some agricultural applications, for example. So biodegradables are a part, but they're not the solution to littering. Thank you, Richard. So let's move across to um, Constantine. There was some, some interesting discussion um, about the I guess the regulatory side of, of the product and, and safety side of, of, of products that had either been 3D printed or had been repaired with 3D printed parts and the fact that consumers would lose, potentially lose safety or compliance with safety certificates through through that kind of repair. I don't know if you have yeah. comments on that side, Constantine. It's a fantastic question. And I think the, the answer to me lies in just the formulation and the, how deeply the word consumer is embedded in our culture uh, we see ourselves as consuming these things and that somebody else takes care of the responsibility somebody else needs to design a safe thing that be mindlessly consuming and that is just incompatible with the way uh, how you would uh, how would you be able to repair uh, if you repair it take responsibility for yourself for the repairs uh, of course if you send out repair to somebody you outsource that responsibility, but it is, uh, is I think, one of the most problematic things, just this understanding of consumer and regulation of the consumer market that somebody else uh, needs to uh, regulate everything that happens. So uh, it is, uh, that's that's why I think uh, my key answer to that is uh, developing literacy around using these technologies. It's about understanding uh not just uh, how do you design a pretty bottle it's about how do you design how do you make and how do you use a bottle uh that uh, that that would take all these boxes and uh, uh and maintain its function and uh, uh be recyclable afterwards so, um does, does that anywhere uh answer yeah, thank you. I think that that brings certainly brings a new perspective to the debate. There's there's some interesting discussion that you should um you should look Constantine when you have time afterwards. Mm -hmm. If we can bring that discussion across to a discussion board, I think that'd be really handy afterwards. So there's some there's some nice opinions in here that that need ironing out. I think. Mm -hmm. Um, something just to build on that, um, Constantine. There's a question as, as to mm -hmm. whether you can combine a repair cafe with a 3D printer, and, and oh, yeah, how absolutely. it might take. So say you, you gave some examples of repairing component parts mm -hmm. on everyday items. How mm -hmm. long does that take? Uh, it depends on the parts. Some parts can be printed in minutes. Some parts can be uh, need to be take uh, I don't know hours and sometimes days to print. But I think for most of the consumer uh, again this 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 side. But for, for kind of uh, most of the consumer goods that need to be uh, repaired, those uh, those simple parts can be printed in minutes. Uh, it takes uh, it may take a bit longer to design them, and it may take several iterations to get it right. Uh, so it's the design process uh, that is normally the bottle, not the printing time. Uh, but it's exactly that design and that understanding of how do you shape these objects, how do you create them, is uh, uh, what can be uh, what can be taught uh, if that if that becomes part of this curriculum uh, as much as basic reading and writing and numeracy skills are. 
everybody is able to uh, to design the things uh, how they need to. Uh, there's uh, uh, all these bottlenecks effectively eliminated. It's not the three D printing environment uh, that there is the obstacle able to design uh, these things. Sure, no, that makes a lot of sense. And if we can move back across to to, to you, Richard, for for a moment. Um, there's a question, if, if we were to stop all plastic production tomorrow, sort of a hypothetical question, could we mop up all the plastics already in the environment? And I guess sort of to add a little nuance to that, and what would the incentives, where are the incentives and gains to that as well beyond the environmental? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's a really good question. And, and, I, and it's back to the point that I made about, we need better evidence around the solutions. And, and it's, although it was beach cleaning with Marine Conservation Society that first got me into the topic of plastics. And I think that cleaning beaches is a, is a really, really, really good thing to do. It raises awareness and it takes the litter out. But let's not forget that if we see that as the answer, if we see clean up as the answer, then we're going to be cleaning up in perpetuity. Our children and our children's children are going to carry on cleaning up. And to me, in terms of technological fixes, I feel at the moment we've got too much money being invested in the idea that there's going to be a magic technological vacuum cleaner that's going to scoop all this stuff out of the oceans. We'd be far better at the moment to focus on turning off the tap the same way that if the bath's overflowing, you don't focus on mopping up the floor, you try and turn off the tap. And that's where we've got to be investing 90%, 95% of our resource at the moment is learning how to turn off the tap. As we do that, then I think the spend on cleanup, it could rightfully increase. But at the moment, it's just going in so much faster than we can hope to take it out. So I'm almost, it's, I hate to say it as a marine biologist, but I'm almost not worried about the cleanup. What worries me immensely is that the bath is overflowing and we're showing no signs of turning off the tap. And so there's a slight tension there that and I, I think we've got to focus on turning off that tap, even though I want to see us subsequently move to cleanup. But it's going to be very challenging to remove microplastics. And I think there's a fallacy there for us to imagine that we're ever going to be able to cleanse the oceans of them. So let's get that tap turned off quickly. Thanks, Richard. And one more question for you, Constantine. Um, how do we ensure manufacturers give consumers the knowledge they need to take responsibility for the products they purchase? So when it comes down to the repair, so it kind of picks up on the debate that's been going through in, in the question and answer. So I don't you have a quick comment on that before we close. I think, I think uh, the biggest uh, ongoing initiative for that is the right to repair. Uh, this, uh, uh, that is the single kind of currently uh, most widely adopted and most uh, momentous uh, initiative uh, that is that is already making a uh, change in this in this area. So hence this uh, uh, happy 3D website has uh, uh, a number of manufacturers already publishing uh, publishing. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't bring this one up before, but it's not necessarily immediately related to digital fabrication. But Fairphone is a Dutch company uh, that uh, designs from scratch repairable and replaceable uh, phones. And they were the first in the industry to establish as well a uh, fair trade gold supply chain for their phones. And uh, so they're aiming for completely conflict free mineral supply chains for the phones. So there are already uh, substantial initiatives that direction. And just kind of the more uh, uptake we have on the society level for this, the, the stronger they become. But there's already very focused initiatives driving that. Excellent. Thank you. So I think we're, we're slightly over time. It's, it's break time now. So I want to make sure everyone has time for a, a screen break before the next session. So on behalf of the uh, the audience and, and, and the team, thank you very much to both of our speakers for some really stimulating talks, which has in, certainly triggered some great conversation in the question and answer. And as I said before, I hope we can bring that across to the discussion boards to continue. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.